Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. We praise you that you've given us your Holy Spirit and you've transcribed your word in our closed canon that we might approach even a chapter like Revelation 17 and understand it, be edified by it, and I pray this morning be rightly encouraged by it. I ask, Lord, in in the midst of this apocalyptic literature that you would cause us to be awake, that the, the difficulty of the passage would not lend itself to sleepiness or idleness of mind, but you would keep us sharp that we might hear it, that we might understand it, and receive the important teachings that come from it. Father, we we want to rightly respond to the revelation of these truths about the judgment and salvation to come. Uh, Even today, Lord, as we're living in the midst of a time where we see the activity of the prostitute and the beast Certainly here in this place, certainly here in the West, I ask, Lord, that you would enable us not to be discouraged, but to make us wise, that we would persevere, that we would share the gospel with those who have been seduced by the prostitute, um, and that you would keep us to the end, Lord. We want to be a faithful people. We want to be a faithful church. And so use this passage to encourage us to that end, I pray, not only for our well-being, but for, of course, and above all else, your glory. Um, Help us today, Father, with your spirit. Uh, Be present and move amongst us in a mighty way. Let this be a time of great worship to you, where from your word you would um, cultivate in us a great and deep love for Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm thankful you're here. I'm thankful you didn't read the passage and say, there's no way we're going to figure this one out, so I'm going to bypass Sunday. Um, I'm thankful that you're here. There, there is a way through this, my beloved, so uh, be patient with me. We will make our way through. The reason I'm doing the whole chapter is it's a whole unit. Um, if you break it up, it becomes very weird, so it's a whole story, and it's actually much more simple than, than you think, um, so I hope that the Spirit will reveal that to you today. Um, this is a, Revelation is a spoiler, if you haven't noticed. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a big movie guy, but I hate it. If I'm going to watch a movie and someone spoils it for me, you know, they don't give me the spoiler alert, they tell me what the end is, because then you're, the, the entire time you're watching it, you know what the outcome's going to be. So all the intensity and the suspense and the anxiety and the fear that may come during watching that movie, if you know the end, it, it, it's there, but it just dissipates itself. Um, I remember the first time I watched the Lord of the Rings series, uh, that trilogy, and I, I didn't know how it ended. I didn't read the books. And, you know, so as, as, as Frodo and Sam are making their way to Mordor, trying to destroy the ring, and as Sauron's gaining power, and the questions is, will, will uh, Aragorn actually become king? All those things, I was in suspense. And then the end comes, and you have all the, the great workings of um, the story culminate. Um, the second time I watched it, with Brandon, <laughs> Brandon loves Lord of the Rings. The second time I watched it, um, it was good. The battles were real, but it wasn't that. I wasn't on the edge of my seat thinking, you know, is Minas Tirith going to fall? Is Helm's Deep going to fall? That wasn't there. Um, God is the great spoiler when it comes to the narrative. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, he told us, he told us what? That the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That in the end... God would win, and God would win for mankind. And so when it comes to spoilers, the entire book of Revelation is a spoiler alert, um, which is good because God does that for a purpose. He wants us to know the end. He wants us to be crystal clear about the end so that in the midst of the story, and we're still in the midst of the story, we know that evil will not prevail. We know that Christ will win, And because we know Christ will win and we are attached to Christ, we win too. And so we want God to spoil the narrative so that we know the narrative. And that's exactly what he's going to do for us today. If you remember two weeks ago, we we finished up the cycle of the bowls. That was the third and final cycle. We had the, the seven seals, we had the seven trumpets, and then we finished the seven bowls. And that was God's, that was the end of the story. That was God bringing his final judgment upon all sin and evil. But as with the ending of the, of the seals and the trumpets, God does what he's done here in the book of Revelation. 
he recapitulates or he reiterates the story. He circles back again. And what he's going to do in 17, 18, in the first part of 19, is he's going to give us more detail about what this end look lo- looks like. And he's going to do it by, by personification. Two women. Two women. You have Babylon, the harlot, the prostitute, the city of man, that he reveals how he's going to judge for her false worship and for her idolatry. That's woman number one. And then you have woman number two, which is the bride of the lamb. It's those who have been made right and righteous by the blood of Christ. And of course, the story in the next few uh, chapters about her is her being saved out of the judgment. It's God redeeming her out of the judgment. And so today we're going to focus on 17, and 17 focuses on the prostitute. Now you say, oh my goodness, I, I've never been to a church where you talk about prostitutes. Well, um, I, I normally wouldn't talk about prostitutes, except it's in the Scripture. So we want to be faithful to the Word of God. We want to know the Word of God. I want to preach the Word of God, not my Word, and it talks about the prostitute. Um, so I hope that that Word does not offend you. Um, this is cryptic, but here's the main theme. You ready? The world rages against God. The world engages in false worship, which is rebellion against God. God destroys all of that. And then he saves his people through it in Christ. That's all of 17. Lots of details and what that looks like, but that's the, that's the thrust of the entire chapter. And so my hope today is that we will be able to look at some of these. Uh, some argue that 17, 18, and the first part of 19 are some of the most difficult verses in the book of Revelation, and I would agree. <laughs> you read it, you, you probably heard Kirk reading, you're going, what? First, second, third, come again, gone? What, what is going on here? Well, um, these are, I'm gonna give you three spoiler alerts, all right? Three simple truths from the scriptures that I want you to take away, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to enable you to live in accordance with them. Number one, the deceptive beauty of false worship. Number two, those called out of false worship, and by God's grace, that's you. And number three, the inevitable destruction of false worship. So the whole, the whole chapter really is dealing with false worship and God's response to it. Um, the theme would be this, I guess, God saves his people from prostitution to glory through the Lamb. God saves his people from prostitution to glory through the Lamb who we know to be Christ. All right, are you ready? Can I start? Point number one, are you with me? If you're with me right now, if you're still awake, say amen. Okay, very good. Point number one, the deceptive beauty of false worship. Look at verse one with me. Verse one, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute, that's Babylon, who is seated on many waters. Now, if you were listening when Kirk was reading, he already described, we know the many waters already from verse 15. It's the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and the languages. In other words, the, the great prostitute, Babylon, is comprised of all people and all languages and all nations. This is a global phenomenon, right? This is the whole world participating. Look at verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality. When we hear that sexual morality in the book of Revelation, I want you to think idolatry. I want you to think false worship. Because that's generally what John's talking about. With whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual morality and with the wine of those whose sexual immorality, the dwellers on earth, those are all those who are not saved, have become drunk. So the kings of the earth, the earth dwellers, all those outside of Christ, this global phenomenon, have become drunk on what? On false worship. Drunk on idolatry. Drunk on putting their hope and their desires in that which is not God. And the portrait here of this global idolatry really is a reflection of what Paul described very clearly in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. This is the world he described, that all mankind knows God but will not honor him as God or give thanks to him as God and worship what? Worship the creation, worship created things. And so this is the end picture that John is now seeing of the entire earth. Look at verse 3. And he, now speaking of the angel, he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. Now the wilderness um, oftentimes in Scripture is a place of judgment. So the angel's taking John out into the wilderness to show him the judgment of who? The judgment of the woman. I saw a woman, this is Babylon, the great prostitute from verse one. So when you hear the great prostitute, the harlot, the woman, uh, the city of Babylon, all the same. 
We're speaking of the same entity here in rebellion against God. Now, when John was writing this, this is clearly speaking of Rome. We're talking about the Roman Empire in the day of John. But as we've seen throughout the book of Revelation, what it meant to John and the people, the seven churches in Asia Minor in the first century, it also had symbolic meaning throughout the centuries. In other words, this woman, Babylon, is symbolic of any world power throughout human history that rebels against God, specifically by bringing its self-glory and persecuting the church. Any world power that brings itself glory and persecutes God's people. And what John sees here is really, it's extreme. He sees this prostitute, this woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And that's the same beast from chapter 13. That's any government or any power that's rebelling against God. And then the beast is described that was full of blasphemous names. So these governments are anti-God through and through full of blasphemy and hatred toward God. And it had seven heads and ten horns. Of course, that was descriptive of, of power that those nations had. In other words, here's the picture that John gets. This, this woman, this prostitute, is riding this beast. And the woman or the prostitute's an empire. And the beast are the nations within the empire that that empire has subjugated and, and required to engage in false worship. It's an ominous sight. And certainly it described Rome in the day of John, but it would also describe any totalitarianistic regime, any empire throughout history that has used its power to gather nations and subjugate nations and force people to worship idols to engage in false worship other than worship of the one true living God. In other words, the empires use their power to cause people and compel people to turn away from God. Of course, this would be Rome, in John's day, but some of the major empires throughout um, world history would lend themselves to this teaching as well. The Russian Empire of the 19th century, it subjugated 17% of the world. Amazing. The Mongolian Empire of the 13th century, it subjugated 18% of the world. But though, both those two empires pale in comparison to the British Empire of the 20th century, which subjugated 26% of the world. You say, no, wait a minute, that's part of our history. Maybe so, but if you know your history well, the British Empire was not all that God-honoring, and certainly not God-honoring to many of the people in which they brought under their control. So John describes these empires throughout human history. Look at verse four. The woman, that would be one of these empires. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual morality, verse five. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. What a name. Mm. Verse six, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And so this picture It's intended to be one that causes you to to recoil. It's a violent picture of beauty commingled with abominations. This Babylon the Great, this self-glorifying city of man, identified as the mother of prostitutes, so the mother of all false worship and all false religion, responsible for cultivating, encouraging, and even forcing people to bow down and worship false gods throughout human history. So vile, this mother, uh, she's the mother of earth's abominations. She's the murderer of God's people. And yet, did you notice? She's seemingly beautiful. She's deceptively beautiful. Look at, look at verse four again. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet. You're like, well, those are, those are kind of weird colors for us today. Not then, purple and scarlet then. Those were colors of royalty. Those were colors of majesty and power, and we coveted. They coveted those colors in their clothing. And she is adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. And you say, well, now I get that. I mean, I love the precious metals. I like diamonds. I like pearls. Well, they did too, but it, it wasn't just because they liked them, they wanted them. They, again, were indicative of power, and they were indicative of those who were in positions to actually reign and receive glory and honor She even holds in her hand, what? A golden cup. Now, golden cups belong to kings. And this this, um, 
woman is personified as a king or as a queen as she holds the cup. And it's beautiful. It's a golden cup. But look what's on the inside. All the abominations and the impurities of her sexual morality, all her false worship is inside that cup. It's beautiful on the outside and it's violently wicked and ugly on the inside. And herein, my beloved, I believe lies her real strength. This is how the prostitute, this is how Babylon is able to captivate the nations and seduce people to turn away from the living God and come and bow down and worship her, this deceptive beauty. She uses expensive things. Now listen, you would preach this in other parts of the world, they're not gonna get it. In the West, we get it. We get it in a nanosecond. She's talking, she presents expensive, pretty, prestigious, promising things to people and says, come and bow down to these things. Come and want these things more than the living God to ensnare the masses. And oh, how we are ensnared, are we not? I mean, even we today in this room, in the West, that that drumbeat of materialism to get, to consume, to rise, to have power, it's ingrained in us from a very early age to seek after it. And we're told if you get it, I mean, if you make it, right? If If you get that plateau of success and you get that salary and you get that job, We know financial success and material success, we know it brings a bit of independence, does it not? I mean, think of some of the most wealthy people in our culture. They don't bow down or listen to many people, do they? If you have millions or billions of dollars, you become a god quickly unto yourself. It brings independence. We know success brings power. We know the finer things in life. If you've had a chance to enjoy them, it brings prestige, because you have and others don't. It brings physical comfort, the things that our flesh longs for, all these things coveted by the heart of man. They're all temporal, too. They don't last, none of them. And yet each one has the power to draw us away from the living God and to the feet of the prostitute, every single one. For decades now, they, researchers have done, sociologists and psychologists have done cross-sectional studies. And we know this to be a fact. In nations where income rises and academic success increases, worship and faith go down. It's the same thing for individuals. Individuals in countries who are more prosperous, more successful, and more wealthy tend to be less religious, less faithful in any idea of a transcendent being. So we know this is true. And you see, the great prostitute, the great prostitute knows how to draw the heart of man to herself, does she not? I mean, she knows. She, of course, is is participating with the dragon. She's participating with Satan. Um, The prostitute knows that above all else, man desires to what? To be like God. I mean, at the very base of all our sin and all our rebellion, we want to be like God. We want to be God. I mean, that was the deception in the very beginning, was it not? In the very beginning, the lie started with this understanding that we're going to draw you away from God and to the things like God. We're going we're to make you want the purple and the scarlet and be adorned with gold and jewels, and you're going to want the power because our sin hearts do. And so all the prostitute has to do is take that carrot and put it out there and shake it around a little bit, and we run after it like children. Remember Satan's lie? He said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you surely will not die. You will what? You will be wise. You will be like God. And then, and then Eve heard this, and she, it says in Genesis 3, 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was what? A delight to the eyes. She was drawn to it. We're told she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband. Earthly riches, power, fame, beauty, prestige, put whatever you want on that cart of the things that the world draws us to, that we long for. They have the power to move us away from God and move us to the prostitute. They lure us in by all their shininess and all their power. In fact, I would say that that draw is so strong today, my beloved, that you don't In the West, we don't even have to have it. We just need to be associated with people who do. That's how strong it is for us today to be associated in somehow with these promises 
or with this material success or power. In the 20th century, for example, um, one of the primary means that communist countries used to manipulate their people was the promise of a utopian state. Soviet Union, China, North Korea, Vietnam, that at some point in time, we're going to reach this place where you'll have everything that you need. There'll be no haves and, and have-nots. We're going to eliminate that class. And, and that promise moved people to do horrendous things. They didn't have it yet, but they had the promise of it, and therefore they engaged. And, and today in the West, we have millions of people who follow, follow some of the most powerful people on, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram just to be tied to their fame. Well, I follow so-and-so. Well, that's fantastic. What does that mean? It means that I have, I'm participating in their success. Or we align ourselves with a candidate or a political party thinking we're going to ride the success of that. That's how desperate we are. Millions today spend millions of dollars to cram into the auditoriums to look at the beauty and the majesty of people like Taylor Swift or Drake or Shakira or Miley Cyrus to worship and bow down. Literally, when they're screaming and yelling, that is worship, my beloved. Far more so, they get a lot more excited than we do in church. I'm not saying we should do that, but they do. But they do. These lustful desires for physical beauty, for money, for power, for prestige, they're all used by the prostitute to seduce mankind. Very successfully, as we see in our own cultural moment. And the worst part is, God's people are not exempt from this. It's not like we're inside these walls and that's happening outside and it it doesn't make its way into the church. Do you remember Isaiah's prophecy against God's people at the very beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter two, listen to what the prophet said. Um, This is hard because this is us, I believe. Isaiah chapter two, verses six and following. He says, you have rejected your people, O Lord, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east. The east is where their enemies were from. Their land is filled, speaking of Israel, with silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. They're engaged in false worship. Does that not describe in many ways the church in the West today? I think it does, if we're going to be really honest. That description in Isaiah 2 matches the many Western churches today. Are, is the Western church known for its humility? Is it known for its lowliness? Is it known for giving, giving out of poverty, for its sacrifice and service to one another and to the lost? Are we known for that or are we known for our physical beauty? Are we known for our material appearances? More people, more ministries, more building, more money, more technology. That's a successful church. That's what we're told. And yet that sounds a lot like the world. That sounds a lot like the prostitute. It's shiny. It's pretty. It's golden. But not like Christ. The great prostitute Babylon loves to derail God's churches and take our focus off the gospel and the Great Commission and on to ourselves. What do we look like? What do we sound like? How will we get the world inside the church? What a horrible approach. What a horrible approach. So the first thing we see, or I pray that you see from John's vision, is the deceptive beauty of false worship. It looks good on the outside, but on the inside, it is, it's violent. Verse four, it's full of abominations and impurities, and it is hateful to God. So here's your spoil alert. You ready? In the end, all false worship will be revealed as prostitution and God will judge it. He'll judge it. So the question you should be asking that I was asking this week is, how do we escape this? I mean, you're talking about a global phenomenon and the the terms that John uses, the woman, the prostitute, the harlot, the, the city of man, Babylon. How are we, as sinners saved by grace, not to be led astray by such a powerful draw because if you're honest, you say, oh, yeah, but my, my heart loves the pretty. My heart loves the expensive. My heart loves the money and loves the power. How am I not going to be seduced? How am I not going to be drawn away? Point number two, I pray you're still with me. Those called out of false worship. Those called out of false worship. Look at the um, latter part of verse six. John says, when I saw her speaking of the great prostitute, he said, I, I marveled greatly. 
I marveled greatly. And I rarely do this, but in the Greek, it literally says this. I marveled with great wonder. I marveled upon marveling. So he's looking at this prostitute, this, this woman riding this scarlet beast, and, and he's overwhelmed with what he's seeing. This, not only the deceptive beauty, the wicked beauty, but, but certainly the reign of her power, this global ability to seduce mankind into worshiping false gods. And not only that, but he's, he's probably marveling with great wonder that she's able to do this, and God's not judging. Right? This is happening real time. He's seeing it, and yet she is not being judged by God. Well, the angel that he's with comes along and, and in, a, in a, almost a, a rhetorical rebuke, look at, look at verse seven. The angel says, why do you marvel? That's almost a rebuke. Maybe it was. Why do you marvel, John? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and her end is not good and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. And then he, he begins to explain what he's seeing in some of the most difficult language we have in the book. Okay, So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to walk through these verses. And I generally don't do it like this, but it's, it's really saying the same thing that we've already talked about. But, but just let me walk through this with you. Verse 8, so that we're not totally lost. The beast, so remember the beast are governments and authorities that are in rebellion against God, nations against God. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction, and the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Now, some argue that John's talking about empires leading up to Rome, um, that these empires that would what? They would rise up, they would subjugate the nations, they would compel people to engage in false worship, and then that empire would fall. Right? And certainly we see that in human history, not just from a, a biblical perspective. We see that through human history. That they would come, they would rise up, they would subjugate, they would persecute, and then they would end in destruction. Others argue that, that, that John's actually talking about Roman emperors in particular, starting with Augustus Caesar and then ending with Domitian, which was the emperor that was reigning at the time that John was writing. Look at verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. You say, well, Lord, I don't have it because I don't understand it. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, that's clearly Rome, right? We know that because Rome is the city of seven mountains or the city of seven hills. So we absolutely know that John's talking about Rome in his time, but we believe it to be Rome and then symbolic for all empires throughout human history, right? Look at verse 10. But... Verse 10, they are also seven kings. So the seven mountains are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and that's possibly the one who is currently, that's possibly Emperor Domitian. The other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. That's Emperor Nerva was the one who followed Domitian, possibly, if, if you're running with that specific identity. Verse 11, as for the beast that was, and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. So if we're talking emperors, that's Trajan, who followed Nerva, who followed Domitian. Possibly. I don't think so, but possibly. And then verse 12, and the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received power. He said, well, I get that one. Those are ten kings to come, right, that John has not yet experienced. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, which means their reign's going to be really short, together with the beast. And the beast's reign is going to be short. It'll end when Christ comes again in glory. Now, it could be empires. It could be emperors. Uh, I, I think it's neither. I, I, I should say I think it's both. How about that? Um, rather than trying to attach specific empires or specific emperors to these individual categories, Remember what we're dealing with. We're in apocalyptic genre, right? Which means the majority of what is being taught is symbolic or metaphoric in nature. And so I would argue this, that it's better for us to understand these as empires that rise up, subjugate the masses, compel them to false worship, persecute God's church, and then are destroyed. That's what I think this entire section is talking about. 
Empires rising up, subjugating the masses, persecuting God's people, and then going to destruction. Certainly that, that describes Israel's history up to the coming of Jesus Christ, right? I think it describes it really well. Empires would rise up. They would subjugate people. They would persecute Israel. They persecute God's people. They would be destroyed, but God's people would what? Would remain. God's people would be saved. Throughout human history, we've seen this over and over again. Totalitarianistic empires, regimes rising up, gathering the nation, subjugating people, persecuting the church, the empire, the regime falls away, and yet God's people what? God's people remain. God's people last. I believe that John is telling us this is the cycle. It's the cycle in his time. It's been the cycle throughout human history. It will be the continued cycle until Christ comes again, until the Lamb comes and what? Exercises power and victory over this evil. In other words, <laughs> here's the good news and here's how simple it is. Every cycle ends with God judging the empires, the nations, the evil, and saving his people through it. Every single one. That's the cycle that we see, and I believe that's the cycle that John is trying to reveal to us here. So try not to get caught up into those little minuscule details. The big picture is really important. Look at verse 13. This is one of the reasons I, I believe that this is the picture, verse 13. These, speaking of the kings of the various nations, these are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. Remember the beast is that, that nation or, or government or empire against God. Verse 14, they will make war on the lamb. We've already seen this, Armageddon, two weeks ago. They'll make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So as we saw with bowl number six, that the battle of Armageddon, the world raging against God, God coming and de defeating man's rebellion. There's a, a one-mindedness here. They, they gather together. They, they give their power over to the beast. The beast becomes their leader. They engage against the lamb, and the lamb what? Well, the lamb always wins. Christ always wins. Now, going back, Genesis, going back to Genesis chapter 3, man has always been raging against God either individually, as tribes, as nations, or as empires. But God's people, listen, I'll listen with all your might, we are never, ever to be afraid. God's people, for all of human history, are never, ever to be afraid because the Lamb of God always wins. It doesn't matter how big the empire or how big the nation or how big the persecution gets, it doesn't matter how long it lasts, Christ wins Every single time. He is what? Look at verse four again. The lamb will conquer them because for he is Lord of lords and he's king of kings. So there's no one above him. Lord of lords and king of kings. He cannot be defeated. No power, no empire, no sovereignty, regardless of size and longevity, can overcome the lamb of God who is Lord of lords and king of kings. And you say, well, how is he that? He's that in part because he's God, right? So the lamb is Christ. Christ is the second person of the holy triune God. He is Lord of Lord, and he is King of Kings. But it's not just because he's God. We know the Bible teaches clearly that God the Father rewarded the Son. He rewarded the lamb to be Lord of Lord and King of Kings because it was the lamb who fulfilled what? The plan of redemption, it's the lamb who finished the story. Spoiler alert again for you. <laughs> Probably not. When Jesus became our lamb, in order to do that, he had to give up the majesty and the glory of heaven. He had to take off the purple and the scarlet. He had to take off the gold and the gemstones and the pearls. And he had to come down to earth and he had to make himself a man. But that wasn't the extent of his humiliation. He came down from heaven in order to ascend the cross and become hideous on the cross. In order to become the opposite of who he is in heaven. And he became hideous not because he was sinful in himself, but the Bible says he bore our sins in his flesh. He took on the consequences. He drank the cup 
of abominations, our cup of abominations, our cup of impurities, our sexual immorality, our idolatry, our false worship. He drank that cup in full so that he might give us the cup of everlasting life. He paid the price for our pursuit of the deceptive beauty of this world. The money, the power, the prestige, the the education, the success, all the things we ran after thinking, if I get that, I will be like God. He ascended the cross and he paid that price. The beautiful, sinless son of God became, he became ugly on the cross as the lamb of God who was sacrificed to make ugly sinners like us beautiful. To make those of us who were ensnared and seduced by the prostitute children of his father. He did this as the lamb to cover us, to cover our ugliness in his righteousness. He earned that for us. Our righteousness is given to us. It's imputed to us by grace through faith. Christ gives that to us. Because of this great work, God the Father said, I'm gonna seat you upon the throne and you will reign over the heavens and the earth as the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. He cannot be defeated because he is God and he fulfilled the work of redemption. This is what John should have been astonished by. This is what should have captivated his thought. Not the pervasive seduction of evil, not its global nature, not the persecution of God's people. John should have expected that. He'd experienced it in his own life. John should have been astonished, and I do believe that's why the angel rebuked him by the victory that Christ won on the cross for the church. Should have marveled at that the victory that Christ wins for. Look at the latter part of verse 14. Those who are what? Those who are with him. Those who are called. Those who are chosen. Those who are faithful. Unlike those of the masses who are seduced by the prostitute, chasing after power and beauty and money of this world, here we see those who have attached themselves to Christ. They've aligned themselves and associated themselves with the Lamb of God. And because of the work of the Lamb of God, they too receive what? His victory. When Christ wins, if you're in Christ, if you've been united to Christ, then you win too. Now again, you might be saying to yourself, I I just don't know how that's possible, pastor. I know my heart. I know what I long for. I know what I, I look upon the world. I live here in Silicon Valley and I see shiny everywhere. I see Tesla's and say, I want one of those. I go to Saratoga and I see that $5 million home and I want one of those. And I want that job. And, and, I, and I want all these things that everybody else has. Can I be a Christian and have those too? You can, but you can't worship them. You can't lust for them. So bent on the pursuit of sin and our fleshly desires, I think it's right to ask, how will we ever overcome the prostitute? How will I not be ensnared by her? John tells us, look at the latter part of verse 14 again. John says you will overcome because you will be with Christ and you will be with Christ because you are called and chosen and faithful. And so John does something amazing here. He pauses. He's having these these incredible visions and he stops. It's a full stop and he says, I gotta become a pastor again. And so he stops and he speaks as a pastor and he tells us who's not gonna be seduced by the prostitute. He tells us who's gonna be victorious with Christ and he gives us three things, called, chosen, and faithful. Look at the first one, he says, those who are called. And you say, well, what what is that? What is the calling? Well, it's not the general call. It's not, listen, listen very carefully. It's not the, the gospel that goes out to the world, right? That is the general call of God calling all people to what? Repent, believe, and be saved. This calling that John is talking about is known as an effectual call or an efficacious call. And the Bible, that means that's the call that goes to the person that guarantees that person's going to be saved. Guarantees they're going to actually be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. This calling, listen, you wanna see how beautiful this is? This is God sovereignly and personally going to a person, calling them by name, making them alive because they're dead, and then bringing them into the kingdom. 
That's what this calling is. And if you know Christ, that's what Christ did with you through the Spirit. Call, and you know what I'm talking about. At some point in time, you woke up. At some point in time, you realized, I've been dead all these years, and I've been playing with the prostitute and working with the prostitute, and then suddenly God comes to you like, what am I doing? How did I get here? Well, we've been there since Genesis chapter three. I'm trying not to be so excited. I'm sorry. Listen, this is just, it's just so good. It's just, it's just so stupidly good. The Bible clearly teaches that God will call and those he calls, he will save. Romans chapter eight, verse 30. Listen, those whom he, God predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he justified. He makes right in his sight. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You will end with Christ in glory. Because that's God's doing. That's what God does. Do you remember in John chapter 6 after Jesus fed the 5,000? Do you remember he, he, he reveals this incredible teaching? He says the only way you're ever going to get to the Father is if the Father calls you. Listen to this. John 6, Jesus is now talking to the masses. He said no one can, mean no one has the ability. No one can come to me, Christ, unless the Father who sent me does what? Draws him, calls him, brings him in. No one can. And then Jesus says, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Whoever the Father calls will come. Whoever comes, I promise to save. It's so beautiful. Now you might ask, well then, who does he call? Well, John tells us he calls those who are chosen. He said, what does that mean, chosen? The, the Bible uses the word elect. The Bible uses the word predestined. Those before the foundations of the world who God will say, I'm going after that one. I'm redeeming that one. Those who are chosen to be saved. Not because they deserve to be saved. No one does. Well, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one deserves it, but God chooses and he elects and he predestines because he's pleased to do so it's his desire to show mercy and grace and so he goes after people the puritans called him the hound of heaven going after people to save them so that anyone listen anyone who receives mercy and grace from god anyone who finds themselves united to christ anyone who enjoys the blessing of being with God. It's not because of that person's wisdom or their education or their upbringing or their parents or their church attendance or their baptism. It's because of God. It's because God says, I'm going to ordain them to be saved. He decrees it and then he does it. John chapter one, listen to the apostle at the time of Christ. This is before he wrote the book of Revelation. John 1, 12, to all who received him, speaking of Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave them, the Father gave them the right to be children of God. Listen to this. Children who were born, how did they become children of God? Children who were born not of blood, not your parents, nor of the will of the flesh, not you doing good works, nor the will of man, not in your mind, your conscience, but by God. Paul reiterates this, Ephesians chapter one, he, God the Father, chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. Before anything ever was, God had his mark on you if you're in Christ. In love, Ephesians 1, 5, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So why did he do it? It was in his will to do it. It was he desired to do it. So those who will be victorious with Christ are called by God. They are chosen by God. And then the last word here is so important. It's those who are faithful in God. So being called and being chosen does not eliminate the response of man. We are to respond to God's calling and God's choosing us. In fact, I would argue it's the very foundation of, of why we become faithful. Because he calls and he chooses. He makes us alive and therefore we believe. Therefore we follow, therefore we pursue Christ. The term in the Bible is called being born again. He calls you, he chooses you, you're born again, and then you're alive now, you're awake for the first time, and you want to follow Christ. This is the great promise that God made to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, that day when the Holy Spirit comes and makes people alive. Ezekiel 36, 26, God said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit 
I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a, from flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, when God comes, he calls you, he chooses you, he comes and he makes you alive, he gives you a new heart that desires what? To be faithful to him. He gives you a heart that desires to actually follow Christ, to say no to the prostitute and yes to Jesus, to not be seduced by the false beauty, the shiny things that allure us in, no longer saying I'm okay with the outside being beautiful and the inside being ugly. No one wants that. We, we hate it. It's hypocrisy. When God comes to you and he calls you and he chooses you and he makes you alive, you become faithful and you want to pursue true beauty. You, you want to pursue true beauty outside and inside. You want true majesty and glory. Your heart's drawn to that. And that is, of course, we know that's Christ. And therefore, we become faithful to Christ because of the new heart that God has given us. We want Christ above all else. So the prostitute whispers in our ears and presents those shiny things and those powerful things and we say, no, I don't want that. I want true beauty. I want Jesus. And we see Jesus and we follow Jesus. We become faithful followers, called and chosen by God. In other words, your your heart now desires to be faithful. You've been changed from the inside out and therefore the outside will begin to match the inside. Our desire to worship God instead of the prostitute is God's doing. He's sovereign over it. His calling us out of the deceptive beauty and to the true beauty of Christ. Him choosing us to be sons and daughters of him instead of children of wrath. And him keeping us faithful, ensuring that we persevere to the end so that we can have victory in Christ. So here's your second spoiler alert. You ready? You need not be afraid, if you're in Christ, of the world collapsing around you, of the prostitute being worshipped and gathering the masses. You need not be afraid if you're in Christ. God has called you, God has chosen you, and God promises to make sure you remain faithful. Oh, my beloved, that's such extraordinary news. That's extraordinary news. All right, so we've seen the deceptive beauty of false worship. We've seen those called out of false worship. I, I want to give you one more. I don't want to overwhelm you. I pray I did not do that already. Um, I want to look at the inward destruction of false worship. One more. Spoiler alert. Ready? The inward destruction of all false worship. Look at verse 15. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So the prostitute, as we already talked about, metaphoric for Babylon, the the harlot, um, the great city of man. In John's day, it's it's Rome ruling over the masses, over multiple nations and people and languages. And using that power, not for the glory of God and not for the good of mankind, but Rome using its power to bring its self-glory to subjugate image bearers of God and to persecute God's church. But something happens here, and I'm sure you noticed this or, or picked it up when Kirk was reading it. There's a, a change of heart in those who belong to the nations and the beast. Look at verse 16. And the ten horns that you saw, that's the ten different nations or kings, the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast, that's nations against God, will hate the prostitutes. He said, well, wait a minute. I thought they were all of one mind. Oh, they were all aligned against God. That was the battle of Armageddon, yes. But God's revealing now something's going to happen inside the evil. Evil is going to destroy evil. It's going to collapse. It's going to implode upon itself. Their oneness of mind will be no more, and they will make war against themselves. It's an extraordinary picture. Look at the latter part of verse 16. They will make her, Babylon, the prostitute, desolate and naked. So there goes her scarlet. There goes her purple robe. There goes her jewels and her gold. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. So the beast and the nations will rise up and destroy the totalitarian reign that subdued them. Force them into false worship and abuse them over time. But I, one of the things that's fascinating about this is this doesn't just happen. Suddenly the, 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 the beast and the nation don't wake up and say, you know what, we're going to turn to God. Not that at all. Look at verse 17. This is all God's doing. Verse 17, for God has put into their hearts, 
into the hearts of the nations, into the hearts of the beast, to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. That is the destruction of the prostitute. And so just as John showed us that those who are called and chosen are faithful is by God's sovereign decree, even here, the destruction of evil is by God's sovereign decree, using evil to what? to destroy evil. God uses evil to destroy evil, to leave the prostitute desolate, naked, and burned with fire. In other words, God takes their hate-filled hearts of the kings and the beast and turns them toward the prostitute. And, And they want to exercise that. They want to go after Babylon. They want her power because they are equally sinful. What God reveals here, though, is that all things, good and evil, are under his sovereignty. Every single thing that is transpiring in the narrative in chapter 17, and we can say throughout human history, is under the absolute, perfect sovereignty of God. Nothing happens outside of the sovereignty of God, including evil. Now, you talk about comfort for the believer today. I mean, it's not uncommon if you're talking to fellow Christians and you're talking about world politics or you're talking about the economy or you're talking about political movements and there's this, this right dialogue of how dark it's becoming and how evil it's becoming. I had lunch with a brother who's a little bit older than me and he says, is it me or do things seem like they're getting a lot worse? Is it just me? I'm like, well, it might be you. I, I, I don't know, but things are definitely, they're, they're getting worse, which is exactly what Revelation tells us. So as we see the world seemingly collapsing around us with all standards of of civil society and morality being destroyed, uh, and maybe that evil making its way into your life, into your job, or into your marriage, or into your home, you have to know that as you experience it and as you go through it, that God is still sovereign over it. Now this is, you say, well, that's a, that's a theological point. You talk about the sovereignty of God over evil. It's so important for your practical day-to-day living that you know that evil is not outside of God. It's not happening by chance or circumstance, either in the world or in your life, that God decrees he's sovereign over. Nothing happens apart from his direct movement. And so that means, my beloved, if you're in Christ, you can say, what is the Romans 8, 28 that we love so much? That for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose, literally all things. The world that's collapsing around you, the evil that's made its way into your life, it's sovereign. God is sovereign over it. And therefore he uses it for your good and for his glory. Now that's great news. (laughs) I don't know about you, but um, I have encouraged a handful of people to not watch so much news. I I have. I said, listen, you've got to stop watching and reading so much you're like uh, you know and then you can't make it through the day but you want to be informed right but god's sovereign read your bible and then watch the news and then read your bible again pray and watch the news and then pray again god is sovereign over all the details so we don't want to freak out we don't want to be afraid but we do want to rightly be warned by it the, the right warning that if we participate in the evil, we too will be destroyed. Right, the warning that comes out of this is that evil will implode upon itself and that by the sovereign decree of God in that no evil will last. All evil will be judged and destroyed and if you are part of it, if you've attached yourself to the prostitute instead of Christ or you've seemingly done both, which means the prostitute, then judgment and condemnation is all that belongs to you. The city of man, no matter how powerful she might seem, especially today, cannot last. She cannot last. She cannot even live under the weight of her own sin. She must collapse. Look at verse 18 again. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. He found this final picture of the prostitute reigning over the earth, and yet this great city of man personified as this woman with power will be destroyed by God and destroyed by the very evil she perpetuated herself. It's extraordinary in light of the beginning of the vision when John was astonished. 
he's now going to be equally astonished by how she will be destroyed internally and externally, internally by evil and externally by a sovereign God, that she cannot last. Now, if this is true, if we know all sin and all evil and all work of the prostitute is one, inherently destructive, and two, will be destroyed by God, then I have this last question, and we're going to close. Why, my beloved, why, why continue in it yourself? Why would you attach yourself to sin or rebellion or anything to do with the prostitute when you know in so doing you will be judged? Why play with, why practice, and why be, dis- be seduced by that which destroys? No matter how beautiful or how seductive that sin or that idol looks on the outside, you now know, you said, I get 17. You now know in, on the inside it is an abomination to God and it will be judged. You know that now. Every sin in your life, every temptation that you said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna latch on to it. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna be seduced by it. We know here leads to destruction. If you've been called and chosen by God, and I pray you have, then your path of faithfulness is a path of holiness. If you've been called and chosen by God, faithfulness in Christ is holiness to God. It is not being seduced by the false beauty that's out there, and it's everywhere. It's not being okay with your outside looking good and your inside being rotten. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, that, even in the church, we pursue a lot of physical beauty, don't we? I mean, we, we pursue it with our bodies and our clothes and our hair and our, and our makeup. We pursue the outside while we're okay with our hearts being dark on the inside. Well, that's, that's hateful to God and it's destructive to ourselves. The pursuit today of of knowledge in the church that puffs up rather than knowledge that draws us to humility in Christ. The pursuit of money or power, not, not to use it to bless others, but to glorify ourselves and, and bring things to ourselves. All these are forms of false worship. And God is saying clearly they are vile to God and they will be judged by God, have nothing to do with them. We're gonna see that calling again next week because God knows how easily we are ensnared. As a Christian, your path of faithfulness is grounded in your heart being captivated by Christ. That God placed his love on you, that he called you and he chose you, and he placed the love of Christ upon you. And you're so raptured. We can talk about rapture in the context of rapture. You're so raptured by the love of God that you want to be authentic. You want to be authentic. You want the outside and the inside to match. You want to be obedient to God's word out of love. You want that. You desire that. You want to work and you want to play and you want to serve and you want to love because you have been called and chosen by God. And what an honor. What a privilege that the creator of the universe would call and choose you to be saved. You'll want to because now you're a son or daughter of your father in heaven. And so you want to bring him glory, don't you? I mean, you want to live a life that he's truly pleased by. That he says to you daily, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful son or daughter of mine. Well done, following Christ, loving my son, the one who died for you, the true beauty, so you could be made beautiful by him. Friends, John's vision in chapter 17, although I would say linguistically cryptic, it's basic and I think really, really clear. The world will rage against God by worshiping other gods. God will come and he will judge the prostitute, the beast, the nations, all who worship anyone or anything other than his son, Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that judgment, God will redeem his people. He will save his people out of that judgment and into his glory. So there's no reason for the Christian to be afraid because Christ wins. There's no reason 
for us to make a practice of sinning because we know that all sin will be destroyed by God. And there's every reason for us to live today and every day as the called, chosen, faithful people that we are. Amen? Every reason today and every day until Christ comes or he brings you home. Let's pray to that end right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the clarity of this chapter. I thank you for the Holy Spirit enabling us to to see this very clear cycle. We praise you, Father, as your people that we will not be condemned with the prostitute. We praise you for calling us and choosing us and making us alive in your spirit, giving us new hearts to want to come out of such abominations. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us today individually and as a church for bringing so much of that in, so much of the beauty on the outside, the gold, the jewels, the dress, and so little purity and humility on the inside. Forgive us for that, Father, and by your Spirit, change that order. Make us more concerned about our hearts. Make us more concerned about the hearts of our brothers and sisters than how we look or the cars we drive, or the homes that we live in, or the jobs that we occupy. I pray, Lord, that you would do that, that you would sanctify and make this church a a radically holy place. And in so doing, Father, you would not only bless those that you gather here, but you'll bless the community in which we live, that will be the salt and light to them. I thank you, Lord, for this time, for those you've gathered here. I pray you would use this clear teaching for your glory by transforming us into the image of your son. I ask these things in his name, amen.